Hello, good afternoon. Today, we will be having a discussion with one of the great economists of our time, Professor Gregory Clark. How are you doing, Gregory? Oh, fine, fine. Thanks for having me on. So, Gregory, do you know that you are a legend? No, I know. Yes. I, I very much doubt that. You are the David Landes of our era, and I'm a big fan of Sir David. Oh, well, thank you. That's yes. uh, a flattering comparison. Yeah, and I, 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 if David were alive today, obviously he would be cancelled because many studies are actually proving his assertions that culture yeah. is important and culture makes a big difference. Uh, yes, no, he would be in trouble, I think. Yes, and, <laughs> and, and, and as we know, David did not back down. Uh, no. <laughs> not at all, not, not, not at all. It didn't mat matter to him if you wanted to cancel him or if you called him a racist, that was irrelevant. But Gregory, today we'll be talking about the Industrial Revolution, culture, and some of your interesting papers. But before we do so, I must say that your, your book, A Fair, a Fair World to Arms, A Brief Economic History of the World, that will be discussed, but not in the first section. I'm going to start the conversation by talking about the Industrial Revolution. So Gregory, what was the Industrial Revolution? Well, um, it was the emergence uh, after many millennia of consistent technological advance uh, in economies. Uh, and as I say, that first appeared uh, in Northern Europe uh, in the 18th century. All right. And how did the Industrial Re Revolution change society? How did it change society? Yes. Uh, well, in, in so many ways. I mean, it really is the great event uh, of history. I mean, before that, uh, living standards were not always low, but they were constrained eternally to fall within certain bounds. Uh, really driven by Malthusian mechanisms. <clears throat> After the Industrial Revolution, uh, consumption possibilities became unbounded. Uh, population growth effectively became largely unbounded. Uh, and uh, humanity began to explore uh, whole new ways of life uh, and uh, whole new ways of organizing society. So it really is uh, the great event of human history. Yes, Gregory. Now, China also had f free markets and property rights during the medieval ages. Greeks, Greece and Rome had brilliant citizens. And some researchers like Jose Ober are actually saying that there was a correlation between a correlation between institutions and innovation in Greece. So why didn't these civilizations sustain economic progress? Well, that is one of the things in my book that I uh, draw a lot of attention to, which is that modern economics is really dominated by the idea that people haven't changed that much over time. It's all a matter of changing institutions and changing incentives specifically. And the problem is that you can find long before the Industrial Revolution, highly incentivized societies with relatively stable property rights. Uh, and yet they just lack that vital element of consistent uh, technological uh, advance. And so uh, that's why the Industrial Revolution has remained such a, a dramatic puzzle uh, in part, it's because all of our kind of mechanisms of explanation have tended to kind of uh, be around uh, incentive changes. And the important thing about England as the source of the Industrial Revolution is that England actually evolved very slowly between the Middle Ages and the modern period without really many dramatic shifts in regime. And the great puzzle then of the Industrial Revolution is it's occurring across what is a very stable institutional background. But in that background in 1700, there's very little technological advance. By 1800, you've got modern rates of technological growth. And so as I say, that, that's what makes the Industrial Revolution very, very challenging as an event to a historical event that we need to explain. Yeah, I, I agree with economists who assert that ideas matter, but do you give credence to the assumption of Deidre McCloskey that 
Western Europe experience a change in, in, in moral than ideals? Bourgeois, what's the terms bourgeois dignity? Yes, uh, I, I partially agree that in some sense, it's about the way the world functioned and about the way people thought about the world and the possibilities that they thought about in the world. And so I agree that far, but I think what uh, I try and argue in my book is that those ideas didn't emerge from nowhere, that there were actually forces driving these changes in the way people behave, the ideas they held, and that there was actually mechanisms within the Malthusian world that were changing people and changing people in a very fundamental way. And so I think that's where I would, I would disagree with the kind of McCluskey interpretation because in the McCluskey interpretation, there's just ideas have a life of their own. <laughs> they develop from earlier ideas and you really have an intellectual revolution that then drives this material revolution. In my thinking about this, <clears throat> there's actually a process of evolution within the Malthusian world that changes the way people think about the world, the way people operate. And it's really, it's making the material really the, the driving force of the ideological changes that were occurring. Yeah, yeah, all right, Gregory. So new studies are showing us that political fragmentation can explain the rise of Europe. China was an empire and, and emperors do block innovation because if you're a king, you want to promote stability. Disruption is not your goal. But had China had an environment like Europe that was more decentralized, do you believe that the industrial revolution would have occurred in China? Because the truth is this, the Chinese were brilliant and China had, a, had an intellectual movement similar to the enlightenment in Western Europe, but it failed. Um. I'm, I'm certainly willing to consider the argument that the fragmentation of Europe was important in the sense that it created all of these different centers where people could try out different methods of organization or different ideas. The thing that gives me hesitation though is that while the Chinese emperor could block things like overseas trade and successfully do that, um, for the small scale textile innovations and, and machines that were coming in, it's not obvious that an empire as large and as diverse as China was, that you could actually stop those types of activities from developing. And so I'd have to see much more, more convincing ideas about how the decisions of the emperor at the center actually impacted the technological changes that people were making at the village and small town uh, level in China, because th those were the mechanisms that really drove a lot of the industrial revolution were these artisanal innovations. Yes, Gregory, we are to, re to remember that legalism is still evident in China, meaning that China is a rule by law state, not a rule of law stage. So because China's culture is so different from the West, I doubt that had the Chinese resided in a similar circumstance that they would have industrialized. They had, access, uh, they, 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 they had insight into Western technology. The Jesuits went to China. Right. Oh, I, I agree. I, I mean, what I would say is the account that I end up giving in a farewell to arms of, of the kind of the source of the industrial revolution, um, one of the, the deficiencies of that account is that it would seem to point just as strongly uh, or even more strongly at China as the ultimate uh, center of the industrial revolution. Because as I say, it, it says that the long period that society spent as settled property rights, agrarian societies, were actually changing the nature of competition in terms of who was going to survive to the next generation. And that was actually changing the types of people we had around in the world. And that process you think would have occurred just as strongly in China and for even longer than in Europe. And so I, I agree that there, there is still a, a kind of very strong puzzle about why not China? Because we've certainly seen since the Industrial Revolution 
that the Chinese kind of cultural legacy uh, is such that they are very successful within Asia and even wider in terms of commercial activity. So if you, if you look at say places like the Philippines or Malaysia, Chinese laborers imported to work on plantations there end up actually being the commercial heart of those societies. And so it, it certainly seems that deep down <laughs> within China, there, there was a lot of this uh, 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 kind of bourgeois uh, 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 commerce drive that was available in the society. Uh, and so I agree that, that, that in some sense, uh, it still remains a puzzle as to why not China and why uh, Europe. Yes, and some would argue that medieval Europe was quite conformist, but I contend that the substance of conformity is important. So for example, Edward Grant, the brilliant medievalist, argues that during the medieval era, it was not acceptable to invoke religion when discussing science. Despite the, per the perception of conformity, medieval scholars were willing to debate the existence of God and the, no the, na the nature of angel angels, whereas Chinese conformity was very different. The schools encouraged their best pupils to recite classics in order to regurgitate information, not to topple existing beliefs. Uh Yes, I, I, I would actually, I, I would be a little bit out of my depth if I was to speculate on uh, the nature of, of Chinese thought in the pre-industrial uh, era, but I can certainly attest that within Europe, I mean, if you look at the monastic orders, they had rules they were supposed to obey, but they spent all of their time devising ingenious ways of They were manufacturers and bankers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and also, if you look at, say, the ban on usury in Europe, they spent all of their time figuring out ways of having every possible capital market, but still following uh, the apparent letter of the law on usury. And, and so I can certainly attest that, that Europeans had a very flexible attitude towards religious obligations and towards tradition. Uh, even going back well into the Middle Ages. But, but, but new research is showing that some medieval Christians actually supported user, user and interest rates. Oh yeah, no, I think it was, it was, uh, it was widespread. I mean, it was all through the society. Uh, and uh, they, I mean, they had a capital markets for everything. I mean, you, the, every type of property was available for sale, every type of loan effectively, except short-term unsecured lending was the one thing you couldn't do, but the Jewish population did that. And then the princes were quite happy to tax away some of those profits whenever necessary. Uh, and so, so as I say, that was part of the, the argument here is that uh, even medieval Europe was a highly commercial, very relaxed, society in terms of its bands of, of various uh, religious dogmas. Uh, and uh, again, kind of emphasizing the puzzle is though it wasn't a society with, with any substantial technological advance or at very slow rates of technological advance. Yes, and this is why it's important for us to remember pioneers like Lynn White. Uh, yep, no, he's an interesting, interesting writer. Yeah, the, the medieval ages w weren't as backward as some assume. But Gregory, you, usury must account for the cost of money. I did not invite you to explain usury, but unfortunately, many are still confused as to the reason for interest rates. Could you explain that for us, please? Well, I mean, the interest rate is just the, the reward of for people for deferring consumption to... Uh, from this year to the next year. Uh, it's one of the fundamental prices in any society. And one of the, the kind of unexplained features of world history is that the further back in time we go, the higher tend to be uh, interest rates, even on very safe uh, assets. And so, whereas now uh, the return on home, owning homes or land or something like that is no more than about 2%? Yes. In 1300, all across Europe, you would earn 10% tax-free 
as the return on owning an acre of land or owning a house. Uh, and that's a, a, an enormous uh, rate of return and one that modern bankers would, uh, you know, set up special funds that they could secure. Uh, and if we go back even further to ancient Babylon, it's something like 20 or 25 percent is the underlying interest rate. And so this is one, again, of the puzzles that it's very hard to explain because the only explanation we can really resort to in economics about this is one of insecurity of property rights. Yes. Uh, but we can actually easily see in the records in the medieval period that, you know, an interest rate of 10% only makes sense if the average property is lost to the investor every 10 or 15 years. Um, and we actually see that property is as secure then as it is in modern England. And that in some villages where we have the complete records for 200 years, no one loses property to invaders or seizures or extra legal means. It all passes through the courts. It's very mundane. Um, and, and so as I say, it is a kind of a startling puzzle about this society, which is, you know, why was this interest rate so high? Because it, it offered enormous possibilities of social mobility. Uh, no one had to stay poor in medieval England. Uh, you could buy land in tiny parcels all across the country, you know, a half acre, a quarter an acre. Uh, the cost of an acre of land would only be a matter of a couple of weeks wages. Uh, so any laborer who was willing to defer consumption for a little bit uh, could in the course of their lifetime become a substantial peasant. Uh, and yet this wasn't happening. I mean, rates of social mobility are no higher then than they are now. Uh, and so, so as I say, it is again, a great puzzle of the pre-industrial world. Why were interest rates uh, so high consistently? All right, Gregory, I, 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 I like the conversation. I think we're getting somewhere, but interest rates were high. This is what you're saying, however, modern research has confirmed the observations of Adam Smith that in that relative to other parts of the world, interest rates in Europe are more competitive. Uh, yes, no, but I mean, by the time we get to the Industrial Revolution, the interesting thing is that in England, without any change in the security of property, already by the time of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the most secure rates of return are down to four or five percent. Uh, and at that time, they're substantially lower in England than they are in places like India. Uh, and so uh, it is a kind of a, an interesting fact that uh, low rates of return were associated with the most advanced economies in Europe. So the Netherlands also, by, even by the 17th century, had very low rates of return on capital. Uh, but interestingly, in the Industrial Revolution itself, capital is not that important. Uh, cotton mills and the new machines and these uh, elements of the classic Industrial Revolution were actually not that expensive in terms of capital. Uh, and so, uh, as I say, there is this interesting feature of this world that somehow as societies are launching on modern economic growth, they're also moving towards having lower rates of return on capital, but without any obvious connection between those two transitions. And so what in, in a farewell to arms, what I actually argue is that this decline in rates of return and in interest rates is just a sign of the selective survival of a particular type of person in pre-industrial uh, stable kind of agrarian societies where those who made the most money, who accumulated the most, also produced the most offspring in terms yes. of surviving offspring. And that uh, it, it's wrong to think that if we look in the modern farmyard, that all of the animals in the farmyard have been completely changed and domesticated except the farmer. <laughs> who is the only truly wild creature uh, within the farmyard. Uh, the argument here was that uh, the long pre-industrial stable agrarian period actually saw the evolution of a different type of modern person uh, and one who was adapted 
to the market and to capitalist society. Uh, and and that that's why it took so long to actually eventually produce an industrial revolution. It wasn't that the incentives were not there earlier. It was that the people were not there ready to respond to those incentives in earlier societies. All right. So, Gregory, based on what you are saying, it appears that prior to the Industrial Revolution, based on quality of life measures, Europe was already better off than China. So for example, Mark Elvin made an argument some years ago. I don't know if it's still popular, but he said that China suffered from the high level equilibrium trap. It was already so efficient. Therefore, there was not a need for new innovations. But Stephen Broadberry and others have debunked the view that China was on par with Europe, arguing that compared to Europe in terms of market integration, China was not doing as well. So do you, what, what, what's your take? Oh, I, I think it's true that European living standards were in the pre, by the pre-industrial world standard for, for Northwest Europe, living standards were surprisingly high. Uh, and I think it's true, not just of Britain, but also the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, uh, and that there really was this differential between societies like Japan and societies like Britain. Uh, the other interesting thing, though, is that that differential seems to have been in, in place for maybe a thousand years. Because if we look at skeletal evidence, which is a good indicator of living standards in these early societies, um, the British in 1800 are no taller than the British 2000 years earlier. Uh, whereas, again, the Japanese are much smaller, and they're also much smaller uh, 1,000 or 2,000 years before 1800 uh, from the skeletal uh, evidence. And so I agree that there, there is actually this surprising disparity in living standards around the world, where for some reason, uh, living standards were maintained at relatively high levels uh, in pre-industrial Europe. And that may have played some role in favoring a, an industrial revolution in, in those societies. I mean, it changes the types of goods that people are consuming. Uh, it gives people a little more leeway uh, in terms of uh, experimenting with new modes and new mechanisms. It gives them more space to acquire literacy. Uh, uh, but, but as I say, it's, it's actually quite hard to understand exactly why uh, these living standards differed. Uh, so much. In my book, I actually argue that one issue may have been that Europeans, pre-industrial Europeans had very poor hygiene, uh, whereas in places like Japan, hygiene standards were actually very high for pre-industrial society. And that one of the rewards of bad hygiene in a pre-industrial world is that more children die and living standards consequently rise. Uh, and that it was just, it's not a sign of the sophistication or better organization of European society. It's actually a sign of just uh, cultural differences in hygiene practices that may have uh, favored high living standards in Europe. All right. And Gregory, in many of your articles, you have posited that before the Industrial Revolution, England was already relatively rich. Why did England do so well compared to our partners in, in Europe? Uh, well, I, it, it's rich, but, but it's, if you go back to 1300, for example, it, it's estimated that Italy is even richer than England, right? And so I, I think, uh, I, I'm not certain that England was actually that much richer than other European societies. I think it, uh, it, it's just that we have better measures in England and so the light is much better in terms of seeing what living standards were like in pre-industrial England. Now, I should say, though, this has become the subject of a huge amount of dispute, <laughs> this particular issue. And a whole bunch of my economic history colleagues, particularly in England, have kind of moved to an alternative interpretation of a much poorer medieval England rising towards greater living standards just in time for the Industrial Revolution. Uh, now, that argument, though, uh, 
uh, let me take a step back. How do we know that people were, were very rich in medieval England? Our knowledge came from day wages and from our knowledge of the prices of various goods. And so if you look at those measures, England in 1450, which was the high point of living standards, was well above the level in 1800. And in fact, for laborers, they weren't as rich as they were in 1450 until you get to something like World War I, until there's been a lot of economic growth. Um, the, the, as I say, the, the doubts have come because some people have said, well, people couldn't work that often at those wages. Those wages were for the labor that people could find, but maybe they were only working two days a week and that consequently average living standards were actually much lower. Uh, I, I don't uh, agree with that interpretation. And in fact, I think there's actually very little evidence uh, for that interpretation. And one element in this is that in the records, when they mention a week of work in England in the 13th, 14th, and 15th century, they either mean six or five and a half days. Uh, and so they're not thinking of a kind of a routine where people actually systematically work very few days. Um, and the, uh, as I say, I, th I think the evidence is consistent with the idea that no, these were really the living standards that were available to people and that they were working many days a year at these standards and consequently a very rich uh, pre-industrial society. Yes, the, the paper you wrote is titled The Surprising Wealth of Pre-Industrial England. Uh, yes, and, and in that paper, I, I try and bring in additional evidence on this matter. And one of those forms of additional evidence is, well, what type of housing were people living in in the late Middle Ages? And it turns out that a bunch of that housing actually has survived to the modern period in England. And that's actually a sign that they were living in, in very good housing in the sense that people didn't want to just tear it down and replace it. Uh, and the evidence there suggests that the average family in medieval England, the average peasant family had something like maybe 1200 to 1600 square feet of housing space. Uh, and actually, that is not at all bad by the standards of much of the world, even now, uh, in terms of uh, what was available. And uh, so uh, now it wasn't such pleasant space. I mean, the fire was uh, in the middle of the room. There was a lot of smoke, uh, but it meant that they actually, to, to get rid of that smoke, they had very high ceilings. And so uh, they actually, in parts of the house, would have ceilings that were 20 or 25 feet. Uh, in these houses. And that again implies that they, they had good living standards and since they had to heat a lot of interior space in these houses. And so yes, so another source of evidence is this. Uh, second source of evidence in the paper looks at what was the ratio in towns of the number of bakers versus the number of butchers. And higher income societies, people eat more meat. Low income societies, you eat cheaper bread. And the ratio of those two is a good indication of what type of diet people had. And what is impressive in medieval England was just how many butchers <laughs> there were uh, in these towns. Uh, people were eating a diet that was very rich in meat. And this is something you wouldn't find in poor pre-industrial societies like Japan, where the diet is almost entirely grains. Uh, so as I say, that paper just goes through all kinds of other ancillary evidence. Uh, and, and one last piece is, uh, if we look at isotopes of nitrogen and carbon in people's bones, uh, those actually leave telltale tra traces of what type of diet people had. And the bones of the medieval English suggest a very meat heavy or dairy heavy uh, diet. Uh, and they actually suggest that the composition of the diet there was as rich in meat and dairy as it is for modern America or modern Europe. Uh, so that's why, as I say, I think the evidence really is that uh, these were 
you know, societies governed by kind of Malthusian restrictions in the pre-industrial world, but they weren't necessarily very poor societies. It was quite possible to have rich pre-industrial societies, but, but ones without a lot of technological advance. Yes, quite fascinating observations. The Industrial Revolution occurred in England. Why the UK? What was so special about England? Uh, so, as I say, again, I have to, to you know, acknowledge the, the weaknesses <laughs> of argument. I mean, this is one of, again, the hardest things to understand is why exactly... Very complicated. Of, yeah, this one little island off the coast of Europe. Um, and one thing I would say is... Uh, some of this was just purely a matter of accident. So for example, uh, mechanical spinning of cotton thread was an important component of the Industrial Revolution. What society first figured out how to mechanically spin fiber? The answer was the Italians in the 17th century. Uh, they figured out how to sil spin silk, but silk's a very expensive material and their mechanical silk mills for, uh, really were a very small element of Italian society. The British got that technology in the 1730s by stealing it from the Italians. <laughs> uh, and that's how mechanical spinning was introduced into British society. And then the British artisans actually figured out how to spin cotton. And then there are all of these historical accidents. I mean, cotton was a much lower cost fiber. Uh, the growth of slavery uh, plantations in the US South meant that there was an enormous cheapening of that cotton supply just at the time that you had developed a method of making cheap cotton cloth. Uh, and so as I say, there, there are kind of lots of accidental elements. And, and then, but then the question that comes in is, at what date should we give the Industrial Revolution, right? The British figured out how to spin cotton in around about 1770. So that's why the Industrial Revolution is normally dated there. But you could also make an, an argument for it being in the 1650s in Italy. Uh, and it's just taking a while to play out. And so, as I say, the, the, the actual events of the Industrial Revolution are such that lots of accidents in the nature of trade in the world economy, in the nature of military power, right, uh, can play a significant role in how dramatic and how rapid the transformation of English society was. If Napoleon had won, we would have had a much more limited industrial revolution in Britain, uh, and perhaps a very kind of different accounting of history in this uh, time period. So there's lots of contingencies that end up uh, making the Industrial Revolution have bigger effect than it could have in a society like Italy, as I say, with the mechanization of silk spinning, uh, or that it would have had if Britain had been forced to, for example, uh, engage in very little international trade, right? because a lot of the goods produced in the Industrial Revolution were actually designed for foreign markets in order to import food for Britain's growing population and energy. Uh, and if that prospect had been cut off by military failures, uh, then we would have had a much slower process in terms of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and so, so as I say, there, there are lots of puzzles still. But Gregory, the, how, how, yeah, the, how could we forget the level of material consumption in Britain was higher and nutrition is correlated with health, productivity and cognitive ability? Um, the level was, was good, but, but as I say, it, it wasn't higher than, say, in the Netherlands in the uh, 17th century or early 18th century, but the Netherlands, which looked like a very promising candidate to have an industrial revolution, instead in the 18th century essentially had, uh, after a period of reasonably rapid technological advance, it just froze in place. Uh, and so we can, we can find, you know, Northern Italy in the late Middle Ages 
looks it's actually like richer than China. <laughs> yes. And yes. again, has these high living standards. It has all of these things. Uh, none of it leads to uh, the breakthrough. Okay. And uh, the, uh, and, you know, one thing you can say about the British at the time of the Industrial Revolution is that it does seem to be a society which can do stuff. And it is a kind of very interesting phenomena that, you know, the enclosure of open field agriculture in Britain, which enclosed uh, about a quarter of all the landscape, it's amazing. In modern California, you couldn't do anything like that. <laughs> I mean, there would be all kinds of social protests and court cases and things like that. Uh, the building of the railroad system was an amazing. I mean, it's a complete innovation in terms of property rights and in terms of how do you get this thing through the countryside. Uh, in California now, we're completely failing to build a high-speed railway line, in part because we're just tied up in litigation just to build a hundred miles of this track. Uh, again, in military terms, the British figure out how to beat other countries at sea, how to beat the Dutch first. Um, and, and so it, it really, that there is a kind of a general impression somehow of Britain as a kind of an energized society in that period. And it turns out that there's a kind of synergy between their achievements in one field, such as military, field, and then their achievements uh, in technological advance. Uh, and so, uh, but as I say, the puzzle that still remains is, you know, well, where did that energy come from? Because 16th century England was not such an energized society. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a real puzzle as to, you know, where that emerged. As I say, Deirdre McCluskey would say, this is the bourgeois revolution. This is the revolution of thought uh, that's come uh, to this part of the world. Um, but then, as I say, if you know the history here, the uh, Scotland was invented the modern more... world. That's what they say. <laughs> yes. I mean, Scotland was more educated than England, uh, had more universities, uh, was much more radically transformed intellectually in this period. Northern Germany, uh, you know, uh, Scandinavia uh, were going through probably more dramatic revolutions in terms of the way people thought about the world. Uh, and so it's, as I say, it's very hard then to, to pick out what is particularly different about England, say, example, compared to the, the Netherlands, right? It's its closest competitor in the 17th century. Uh, one thing that is interesting about uh, England is that it was a very fortunate refuge for a, a lot of emigres from elsewhere in Europe who brought skills and abilities. And so the Huguenots, for example, who were driven out by the French king uh, in the around right about 1680, if I remember correctly, um, they were about 1% of English population by 1700. Uh, they, by 1800, were 30 times more likely than the average person in England to go to Oxford or Cambridge. And they completely integrated into the upper levels of British society, but brought with them an incredible kind of intellectual energy and ability uh, to that society. And so another aspect then of, of Britain in this period was that uh, because of its kind of openness to emigres, uh, and again, in the Industrial Revolution period, you're also getting Jewish emigration back into Britain after the complete absence of the Jewish population all the way since the 13th century. Uh, that was another advantage that Britain had in comparison with some of its competitors. Though, you know, Prussia also tried to rec recruit Huguenots. They also went to the Netherlands after the expulsion from France. And so you can see some other elements that might have helped the British in comparison to their European com competitors. Yes, and what did the Industrial Revolution in Britain owe to institutions? Well, as I say, it, it, it's it's hard to see. Well, the the one important institutional background to the Industrial Revolution 
was the amazing and complete laissez-faire attitude of the British government. Uh, and I mean, they faced at times quite intense protests because of the disruption being caused by the Industrial Revolution. So the early Industrial Revolution created a class of quite well-paid handloom weavers, which constituted, you know, a large share of the working population and which in the course of 20 or 30 years was just wiped out by mechanical weaving, but descending into poverty along the way. Um, they petitioned the British government to protect them, to stop this advance of the mills. The British government did nothing. Uh, in comparison in India, uh, under independence, the Indian government protected handloom weavers against modern mechanized mills, even though they're, they're completely non-competitive. And it's continued, I think, to support that sector and to restrict uh, the industrial sector. Uh, and so, as I say, the, the, this was uh, an interesting facet of Britain was the, the amazing political stability of the government. The fact that the government didn't have to fear internal threats and, and that's very different from someone like China or from some of the European uh, powers uh, in this period. So that's one certain potential institutional advantage. Uh, but in terms of other things, things like the patent system in Britain seem to have operated very poorly yes. in terms of giving people incentives to innovate. Uh, and the government didn't do anything really to try and improve that system. Uh, it, it did give individual rewards to particular innovators for meritorious national service. Uh, it wasn't particularly generous <laughs> in terms of these payments uh, to entrepreneurs. Um, and so as I say, I, I, um, uh, I, I think I see some elements which help explain the long delay in the Industrial Revolution and also why uh, the, the, the mechanisms of the Industrial Revolution. But it's still quite puzzling to me, this particular questions of within Europe, why England? Why not the Netherlands, for example? And then again, why Europe as opposed to China? Yes. Right? And, and I certainly say you can find some other societies. So it, it's, it, if you look at India, for example, uh, you can see that there are substantial differences between India as a society in 1800 and Britain. And one of the signs of that is that almost all documentation about India in this period comes from the British colonialists, right? And, and medieval England, we have incredible amounts of documentation about that society. But for someone like India, there's actually astonishingly little about the commercial life or other elements of the society. And, and as I say, that's already pointing out to the fact that there, even in medieval England, where 1% of the population is literate, they still keep quite elaborate sets of records. <laughs> the written word. Records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and, one, and, one, one academic argues that the written word gave Europe an edge. Um, yeah, I, 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 but I can certainly see the differences between someone like India and someone like Britain. But when you go to China, I mean, China has quite an elaborate written culture and, you know, the system of exams, the emphasis on knowledge. I mean, as I say, it has a lot of these things that we associate with Europe. Um, and so, so it is, it does remain a very interesting puzzle uh, why uh, China was not able or did not have much earlier than Europe its own version of the Industrial Revolution. Yes, China had written law, but was the application of law in China rational? To what extent um, was it rational? That's a different issue. I've read many books noting that in China, in pre-industrial China, law was more like to be sentimental than rational. Uh, yeah, no, I have... Uh, seen some discussion about the the absence of clear rules in the Chinese legal system, the absence of precedence. Uh, and I actually have a student who's doing an interesting dissertation at present uh, on colonial Shanghai. And I thought, I, I, unfortunately, she's only been able to find property values for the French concession and the international concession. 
but these were under different legal systems. And so the idea of part of our work is to see when people had a choice, did they prefer to live under English law, essentially, in the international settlement or under French law? But what would actually be more interesting would be within the city of Shanghai, what happens when you went to the areas controlled by the Chinese? Were there clear signs that people thought that doing business under Chinese law was significantly at a disadvantage compared to doing business under English law in the international uh, settlement? And, and so that is a kind of an interesting uh, question about uh, the, um, uh, the nature of the legal system and to what extent it, it, it handicapped uh, enterprise uh, yeah. within China. Well, uh, if a high extent that the common law is superior and based on what we have been reading over the past couple of years from Laporte and others, British law seems to have an edge especially in the area of labor regulation. Uh, yeah, I, I say the, the, the dissertation that the student is working on is really kind of focused on that Laporta and others uh, question. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, she does find that, you know, the, these settlements are divided just by major roads. And so she can look at property values on one side of the road as opposed to the other side. Uh, and she actually does find a discontinuity uh, that going from French to British territory, property values actually increase as you cross the road. Uh, and that there is some preference of people to do business on the same road under British uh, police protection, under British legal protection. Uh, uh, but not it's not a huge difference, though, right? Okay. It, it, yeah, you know, it's not a, 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 a it's not going to make the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful society. But 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 a minor variation can create changes in the environment to unleash major differences. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I agree that um, mm. uh, there's always the the possibility of kind of cumulative uh, causation. Uh, and uh, these other uh, elements. But I, as I say, I, I mean, the, the main things I would just emphasize in terms of my own kind of thinking <laughs> is that uh, I think, you know, we, can, we have made some progress towards understanding the Industrial Revolution, but it remains one of the great mysteries of human existence. Uh, yes, on and, this and someone yeah. someone who gets closer and closer to solving this puzzle is another legend, Joel Mokir, or I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, how is it pronounced? It's Mokir, yeah. Mokir, yes. Yeah. He's, in, he's a genius, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, he has, uh, I, I'm not sure if I would rank him as a genius, but uh, he's certainly uh, a person of amazing breadth of knowledge. Uh, in incredible depth to his knowledge uh, of uh, the history of Europe, uh, other areas. Um, what I, and I mean, and he actually is exploring very much the idea of particular types of knowledge in abundance in Britain as being a, a driver of the industrial revolution. So it's kind of artisanal knowledge. Yes. Right. And so it's this the spread of knowledge from the elites uh, down to a kind of a new middle class. Upper tail human capital. Yeah. And so now, by the way, in, in the new book that I'm working on, I actually have uh, an, an almost complementary but uh, new theory of the industrial revolution. You can discuss uh, that at the end of the sure. conversation. Yeah. But yeah. we're still on the topic of institutions, and we mentioned Joel Mukher. Apprenticeships were crucial to the rise of England. China had similar training institutions, but their growth was impeded by tribalism and the authority of clans. Whereas in, in England, it was easier to engage in knowledge ex exchange and transfer of technology. Uh, yeah, I, again, I, I have to worry a little bit about the timing here because England, you know, uh, there are very good records of the London guilds going way back to the 16th or even 15th centuries. Uh, 
And we see an incredible movement of young people around the country in Britain heading to London to get training in different fields and different crafts. And so England was, was from very early on a, a very open society in terms of access to training and uh, in terms of movement of people with skills around the economy. Uh, in my book, I, I talk about the fact that, you know, English cities in this period, say London, in the 15th century, about 10% of the population is actually foreigners. Uh, again, if you go to Paris, uh, you know, in 1300, uh, a significant percentage of the city actually consists of foreign artisans and craftsmen. And so, uh, you know, again, you know, I, I agree that I think it's important that England is a society with, with a lot of skilled workers, a lot of workers able to take on technological challenges. The only question, again, I have is in terms of timing. Uh, is that really just a phenomena of the late 18th century? Or was this something you would have found even in medieval England, that you, you had this... Uh, uh, these people who are interested in new techniques, who are willing to travel to learn these new techniques, uh, and who uh, you know are very open uh, to innovation. Uh, and, and so, as I say, so so I accept that this was an important element of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I mean, what what's amazing in Lancashire is the ability of basically mechanics to do a lot of the innovation in the textile industry. Uh, and as I say, it displays kind of both high levels of skills, but also kind of high levels of, of willingness to innovate. Yes. And we're still on the issue of institutions. I decided that I will be confronting the major pros, cons, and some serious objections. Now, since the medieval ages, if we're to take people like the late F.W. Maitland seriously, Britain had secure property rights yet the Industrial Revolution occurred later. So one economist, he published a piece for the Cambridge Journal of Institutional Economics. He argues that Britain inherited financial institutions from the Dutch. Because of Dutch reforms, it became easier to create credit and collateralize assets. Um, I, I, again, I'm not an expert on, on the history of banking or financial uh, institutions. All I would say, though, is that, uh, I mean, throughout the history in Britain, people were borrowing and lending from each other and had, at the local level, institutions uh, to do this. Uh, through local solicitors or others who would help place uh, funds or make arrangements to finance <clears throat> these things. And so, you know, I, I don't know to what extent that kind of the high level London banking business was really that crucial to the kinds of technological changes that were making the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and so, you, you know, I, I'm sure these innovations mattered to the property class who are attempting to finance their daughter's weddings and their son's uh, nuptials as well. Uh, but um, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of, of much direct link between banking practices and okay. subsequent uh, economic growth. No, the, the, the last question on the Industrial Revolution and why it occurred in Britain. What did the revolution owe to coal? You have a paper on the topic co-authored with Jack, David Jacks. That, that's right. Yes. Um, yes. So the, the uh, in, here's one way of thinking about the, the role of coal. I mean, it was clear. I mean, there was a huge increase in the amount of coal that was mined in Britain in the Industrial Revolution period. Uh, and in that sense, it would seem, okay, this is an important part of the story. But coal, you know, the Industrial Revolution was well underway before coal became important to cotton mills. I mean, cotton mills could run on water power, and a lot of them did run in that way. Coal mattered for the railroad, but the railroad only comes in full form in 1830, which is 50 years, two generations after the onset of the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, and uh, coal is also replacing wood and as a source of heating for people in the cities. Uh, and then it's also, of course, making things, materials like iron. Uh, but I would have to say, you know, if Britain hadn't had coal, as far as we would tell, it would simply have imported a lot more iron from the Baltic, where wood was cheap and you could make iron. Um, and, you know, uh, the railroad certainly contributed a significant amount of productivity advance in this period, but you could also run trains on wood. Um, and, and so uh, this paper really argues that coal had surprisingly little impact in terms of the efficiency of the economy uh, in the Industrial Revolution period, and that it's really what's happening in the textile mills and in the transportation sector and in agriculture that you see kind of the heart of the productivity advances uh, that are occurring in Industrial Revolution uh, Britain. Uh, and I mean, it is true that the coal mines were going much deeper during the course of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but the, the paper we did argues, well, you, you know, it drives up costs a little bit to go deeper with coal, but it's always possible to dig that shaft further, right? Once you figure out how to ventilate coal mines, uh, there's really no limit on how deep you can make the shaft and there's deeper layers of very rich coal down there. And so you, you can do it and, uh, really, uh, you, you know, you, you're not dependent. As, uh, there's no great technological advance actually really going on. But, uh, but, but Gregory, sector. you're not telling us what we need to hear. Other countries had coal. Uh, yes, no, it's also true that other countries had coal. The thing I was going to say also is the coal in the Northeast, where the main coal field was, had to be shipped by sea, for example, to London. It's no further by sea to the Netherlands. <laughs> Yes. And so the Netherlands had as much access in some sense to the coal of the Industrial Revolution as did most of the sectors of Britain. A, a, and new, a, a, a new position is that England had infrastructure to reduce transportation costs. Uh, yeah, no, England was, uh, the, the, there were very significant improvements in infrastructure in this period, but that was, gets back to this idea of, well, they, they decided to build turnpike roads and to privatize essentially the local roads so that they could be maintained and so that people could be charged appropriately based on the damage their vehicles were going to use due to the road. And that was part, as I say, of this amazing kind of competence in British society that they could have turnpiked the roads any time from the Middle Ages till 1750. But somehow, round about 1750, they decided to do this on a very large scale and produced significant savings in transportation, uh, even though that seems completely unconnected say, with the textile revolution that's occurring 20 years uh, later. And, and that's what I've said. In some sense, one argument about this just says somehow the British just looked at every institution they had in this period and said, we, we can do this better, right? We could take the traditional mechanisms of Parliament now and we can actually get well repaired uh, roads, uh, we can improve harbors. Eventually, of course, we get the railroad, which even further improves things. Uh, but as I said, my, the argument in this paper is that the rents that the British got from owning coal were, were very minor, minuscule. Yes. Uh, they did produce a lot of cheap coal, but everyone else in Europe had access to that cheap coal as well. Uh, and so that it doesn't really help in particular to explain again the Britishness of the Industrial Revolution. All right. That, yeah. No, Gregory? Yep. Yeah, now we can talk about the big boys, your book and the role of IQ and evolution in generating development. This is what most people have been waiting to hear. So for example, IQ, as we should know, is correlated with productivity, economic growth, and the quality of governance. And in most countries, brilliant people, what researchers refer to as the smart fraction, are responsible for innovations. They are predominantly the innovators. So you argue that over time, 
the British environment selected for a certain type of individual. So you can go and expound on their thesis. Uh, yeah, so uh, in uh, starting in, I was actually originally skeptical about this possibility, but in 2007, I published a paper along with Gillian Hamilton, where we were actually able to get a whole collection of wills of people dying around about 1630 in Britain. And what's remarkable about these documents is that people seem to specify all of the children. Uh, and even when they don't want to leave anything to the children, they want to specify that that child is around and is getting nothing, though that's actually quite rare. Uh, and uh, what was just very interesting about these documents is that there's a strong correlation between how much people were leaving and how many surviving children they had. Uh, and uh, this actually uh, suggested there could be an interesting mechanism in pre-industrial society, right? In any society. Yeah, you can be brief because we're wrapping up soon, so you don't need to get into all okay, of the nitty, sure. nitty yeah, gritty. Yeah. No, the survival no, of the riches, fine. you can get to right. that point. Right, so anyway, so survival of the riches, and so you can actually show that it's it was around in Britain for at least 500 years, but I believe this is around in any pre-industrial society. And that what it is doing is it's selecting a certain type of person. And then in the latest book that I'm working on, uh, for whom the bell curve tolls, yes. uh, what I'm trying to show is that the evidence seems to be that social success is actually largely driven by genetics. Yes. Uh, and that there's actually this survival mechanism in pre-industrial society was actually going to alter the genetics of modern populations. Gene culture co-evolution. So for example, some time ago, Baumard came out with a paper, The Psychological Origins of the Industrial Revolution, and he created quite, quite a stir. Now, since then, he has admitted that he should do more work. But so far, I do find these ideas to be innovative. Affluent societies are more innovative. People in, in affluent societies tend to innovate. They trust each other and they're less likely to support authoritarian leaders. So over time, the British in society selected people who were future oriented, trusting and willing to share their ideas with others. So for example, intellectual property rights did not impede innovation because British in inventors on average were willing to share their ideas with strangers. Right. Right. And the, uh, so, the, so this actually, the idea was there is this mechanism, but one of the things that uh, we've actually been looking at, going looking at British history back to 1700, is we've also found evidence that marital assortment. Yeah, assortative meeting. Is, is very highly assortative in Britain, going back all the way, to, we have very, very good data now going back to 1837. And it suggests that people are marrying people who are very similar to them in their social abilities. And one of the interesting things about this is if that was an evolution that came around in Britain, say in the, in the middle ages, right? There's no, that's a purely social thing who you end up marrying, right? Yeah. And it's purely a social institution about what's an appropriate marriage partner. And if you had a society, for example, where everyone married their cousin, you would have much less marital assortment than you get in Britain in 1800, when people are marrying people who are like them in terms of these uh, characteristics, right? Because you'd have to just choose some random cousin whereas in British society, you get to marry someone who really replicates your characteristics. And if this was an innovation, right, the development of, say, the Euro a European marriage pattern yes. that involves this high degree of assortment, then one of the things that will do over time, but not immediately, but over time, is very strongly widen the distribution of underlying abilities within any society. And so if you think that high kind of tail human capital is the key to the Industrial Revolution, then another interesting way that that supply can be greatly magnified is by the social institutions of marriage. Yes. 
and, and the type of people people the person people choose to marry yes and gregory in one of your papers you inform us that even if a woman was not highly educated based on her credentials people tend to sort according to intellect so one may not have a bachelor's or a phd but he's very intelligent you made yeah, this uh, argument in your paper for whom the bell curve tolls a lineage of 400,000 English individuals, 1750 to 2020, shows genetics determines most social outcomes. So this is a paper I really want us to talk about. Genes sure. are important. Right. Oh, yes. And, and so, so the book that I'm working on, there's going to be lots of different tests that we can do of whether there really is genetic connection, uh, uh, transmission that underlies social outcomes. But one of the interesting things we can actually show already with the data is that women are as important to the success of children as are men, even in a society where women didn't have formal education. Uh, and we can show that by looking at, well, what's the connection between a child and its maternal versus paternal grandparent? And for things like occupation or education, it's, it's absolutely symmetrical in terms of importance. And then we can also show how connected the couple is by looking at what's the correlation of a man to his own father versus his father-in-law. And unless you have very high assortment in marriage, you're going to be much more closely correlated to your own father than you are to your father-in-law. But in British society, those correlations are very close. <laughs> And it's suggesting, again, a union of parties which are very similar in terms of their uh, social characteristics, their underlying social characteristics. Even though, as I say, for higher class families, men have education. They go to Oxford or Cambridge or they don't go there. Women have none of these signals, but somehow they're doing this matching uh, in this way. Uh, and as I say, it has these very interesting implications about what the overall distribution of abilities would be. And if you switch from kind of having a pattern of just random marriage to one of highly assortative marriage, it would take something like 500 years for that to have kind of full effect in terms of the distribution of overall abilities within a society. It won't change the level of overall abilities. It will change the distribution though. Uh, and that actually has this nice possibility then of events in medieval Europe <laughs> actually social events actually creating a later industrial revolution through their change to the kind of uh, underlying structure yes of exactly the society but, later yeah yes but but gregory your paper for whom the bell curl tools is very important genes and culture will interact some cultures do not promote academic excellence. So for example, we're familiar with the concept of acting white and it affects minority communities. There are papers supporting the view and papers aiming to rebut it. But this is my argument. If genes are so important and some cultures are negative, then a negative culture will compound the effects of genes. So how can we really help struggling groups? That's a very difficult question. So question. So in the last paragraph of your article, you mentioned Scandinavian style welfare. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the book will be yeah. quite pessimistic. I'm not preempting you, but I'm also right. pessimistic. And then right. before we cl close the conversation, there's another article, you, you don't need to speak extensively on it, I'm going to give the title, Does Education Matter? Test ex does education matter? Tests from the extension of compulsory schooling in England and Wales. No, Gregory, elites are crucial to development and we inherit genes and personality. So personally, I do believe that working class people should acquire education. They need to go to high school and community college. And if their intellect allows them, allows them to do so, then maybe they can become doctors and attorneys. But based on your research and my own survey of the data, the return, the returns on investment for, for investing in lower class pupils are, are not that great. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, this paper we did uh, looked at the extensions of education, which mainly affect lower class students in Britain and finds no 
significant effect on living standards, uh, life expectancy, the, the value of the houses that people were living in uh, subsequently. And that was uh, quite surprising because you know it, it's perfectly possible to have genetic transmission of traits, but also to have social interventions that will make huge differences in outcomes, right? And, uh, but as I say, the, the, the interesting puzzle is that in England, all of the investment in modern education does not seem to have changed the rate of social mobility. It's the same in 1800 as it is now. And all of that investment, if it was going to really significantly change those outcomes, should have increased rates of social mobility. Uh, but another uh, piece of the book is going to, to say that there's actually pretty good evidence that we have not been able to change through those investments the underlying yes. rates of social mobility. Yeah, and, and before we go, I must also say that genes affect intra-group dynamics and inter-group dynamics. So for example, the Industrial Revolution occurred in England and then Britain, sorry, and then Germany and France appropriated British technologies. Many young researchers are actually showing that the, the, wealth gap, the wealth gap across countries is explainable in terms of genetic distance. So for example, America creates a technology, France, Germany, or the UK may appropriate it. So genes and, and culture are very important. The developing world is experiencing economic growth in some quarters, but the culture is still incompatible with the West. So I, I'm not a prophet and I don't like to make predictions, but unless we see a, a, a major transformation in culture, then the wealth gap will continue to grow. Uh, th uh, this takes me actually into an area where- You I, don't have I, to comment on it too much because right, we're wrapping right. up. Yeah, no, no. Where I, I, as I say, it's beyond my expertise. I mean, what I've tried to do in this book is take a relatively homogenous group of people within one society and just ask, you know, what's the dynamics, what are the processes, what's the role of education, what's the role of women. Uh, there are potentially troubling implications for what's happening in the rest of the world. But, but basically in the book, I want to stay just very close to the data that, that I have for England. Yeah. And, and say, you know, this is what we can show and this is what we can observe and, and uh, you know, it, it's, you know, there, there are interesting implications. <laughs> uh, um, another one which uh, will be in the book is there are interesting implications in the data about what's happening to the overall level of ability in a yeah. society like England as a result of differential fertility uh, of different groups within the All society. Right. Okay, yeah. but Gregory, our conversation was excellent. You are a brilliant guest and at some point I'll invite you again. So bye. All right. Sure. Thank you very right. much.